Well, that brings us to our final speaker uh, for this afternoon. I would like to welcome uh, Mrs. Alice O'Leary Randall from the USA. Uh, Alice will provide a personal perspective in 40 years in, medis uh, in medical cannabis. Alice is a senior spokesperson for the medical cannabis movement. In, nine, in 1976, her late husband, Robert C. Randall, became the first person in the U.S. to legally receive medical cannabis. The couple co-founded the medical cannabis movement in America, assisting patients and educating the American public about the therapeutic potential of cannabis. In 1980, they co-founded Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics, the nation's first non-profit organization devoted to medical cannabis issues. They worked side by side on the issue until Robert's death in 2001. At that point, Alice embarked on a nursing career to fulfill her desire to work in hospice. She was a hospice nurse for six years, retiring in 2012. She's returned to the medical cannabis movement and continues to educate and celebrate the contributions of many brave individuals who've courageously fought for medical access to cannabis. She's the author of Medical Marijuana in America, memoir of a pioneer and a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post and Cannabis Now magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ms. Mrs. Alice O'Leary Randall. Good afternoon. Um, of course, I want to thank Troy and uh, Lucy and everybody in UIC for uh, inviting me here today. It's such an honor to be here. A special thank you to uh, to Carol Ireland and uh, the folks at Epilepsy Action Australia for their help in, in bringing me to Australia. Um, I also want to thank uh, my friends at Mary's Medicinals, headquartered in Denver, Colorado, uh, for their ongoing support uh, and for supplying uh, many copies of Mary's Cannabis Primer, which I edit. Um, there are free copies available at the HHI desk out front and also at the Epilepsy um, Australia, uh, sorry, Epilepsy Action Australia desk. Um, so please uh, pick one up and I hope you enjoy that. Um, I know it's the end of a very long day um, and um, I have been to enough conferences to know how frazzled your brain is at this moment. Um, so I, I, I want to assure you I'm going to use very few scientific terms. Um, you don't need to take notes. I'm just going to tell you a story uh, about how all of this began, um, at least uh, in America. Um, this is my late husband, uh, Robert Carl Randall, who is the acknowledged founder of uh, me the medical marijuana movement. Um, in 1976, Robert shattered the absolute prohibition against cannabis when he proved conclusively um, that his eyesight was being saved through the use of cannabis. Um, he forced the federal government to provide him with supplies of the drug. Um, he had glaucoma. He was diagnosed at the age of 24. He was told that he would be blind by the time he was 30. And he discovered quite accidentally uh, that cannabis was helping him. It was lowering his interocular eye pressures. Um, after a battery of tests at the University of California in Los Angeles proved conclusively that this was the case, um, he was able to beat the charges that had been leveled against him following our arrest for growing a few plants on our sun deck in Washington, D.C. Um, his, his legal decision was uh, uh, based on common law, and he was found not guilty by reason of medical necessity. At almost the same time, uh, the, the federal government uh, simultaneously granted a rather long shot petition that we had filed asking for permission to use federal supplies of marijuana. And those two events happening so close to one another um, catapulted Robert into the news. He became a celebrity overnight. Um, and he was one in 213 million. He was literally the only individual in the United States allowed to legally possess and use marijuana for medical purposes. Now, very few Australians are aware that the first news stories uh, about medical marijuana actually broke in the country of Australia. You see, in 1976, we had a friend who was working at the Washington, D.C. office uh, 
of the Australian Broadcasting Commission. And in her job, she met a man by the name of Creighton Burns, who was a Washington correspondent at that time for the Melbourne Age. Um, Creighton was looking for a research associate, and our friend Karen recommended that he hire me. And so I went to work for Creighton, and this was during the time that we were on trial. And um, Creighton became a rather ex officio um, political advisor to us. Um, and he actually wrote the first published article on the medical marijuana movement, which you see here. It was published in the April 19, 1976 um, edition of the Melbourne Age. Um, we missed 420 by that much, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, also at that time, um, we teamed up with Jeff McMullen, who at that point was working uh, in Washington, D.C., and he worked for the Four Corners. Uh, he was a rising star with the ABC. Here you see some pictures that I took during uh, February of 1976. Uh, when he filmed an article or a, filmed a story about Robert, you see him here, very young Jeff McMullen. And um, so you see Australia. Um, has been very critical uh, to our early efforts in terms of getting the news out. Um, and in honor of that, I've actually um, created a t-shirt for my hosts, uh, which you see here, and for those who can't see in the back, um, this is the image that you see here on the back. You heard it here first, folks. So thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> In, in 1975, when, when Robert and I started all of this, um, medical marijuana was nowhere. It seems inconceivable, but there was no news about medical marijuana. There were, no, there were precious few studies. There were no state laws. It, it simply wasn't on the radar. Um, the medical use of marijuana um, had been sent to, to something called the memory hole. And for those who may not be familiar with that term, the memory hall is an invention of the sinister Ministry of Truth from the classic novel by George Orwell, 1984. And the memory hall had, was, had a very simple purpose. The memory hall was where you put things that were politically inconvenient. You slipped them into the memory hall, they were destroyed, and that was that. And that's really what happened with marijuana in America and also throughout the world. For the, early for the early marijuana prohibitionists, medical cannabis was terrifically inconvenient. In the first few, few decades of the 20th century, there were literally hundreds of medications that were cannabis-based. And they were, they were a, a, a staple of the physician's compendium. When the Federal Bureau of Narcotics proposed the 1937 Tax Act, the American Medical Association actually spoke against passage of the law. They acknowledged that cannabis was falling into disuse, but in a bit of prescient testimony, the AMA representative said future research with the drug may reveal new uses for it. And uh, wiser words have never been spoken. The Medical Association was given assurances that the law would not impede uh, the use of medical cannabis in any way. But after the law was passed, uh, like any bureaucratic law, they began to uh, prepare the regulations. And they became too onerous, and the taxing became too much for most people to deal with. And so it quickly fell into disuse. Neither physicians or pharmacists wanted to use it any longer. Within five years of passage, of the 1937 uh, Marijuana Tax Act, marijuana was removed, or cannabis, I should say, was removed from the US pharmacopeia. And that was really the death knell uh, for cannabis as far as medicine in the 20th century. Now, the Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner was a really interesting fellow. And we really can't tell the story about uh, the prohibition of marijuana without talking about Harry Onslinger, who it can safely be said had a real vendetta against marijuana. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, Onslinger did whatever he could to eliminate cannabis from the American culture. And he followed the whims of the time like a weather vane. For example, in the 1940s, marijuana was dangerous because it was used by people of color. In 
and by jazz musicians. In the 1950s, it was dangerous because it was used by communists and socialists. In other words, Mr. Anslinger played on the fears of the time. And he was not unlike his contemporaries in that regard. Um, if you do a Google search for pictures of Mr. Anslinger, um, this particular picture will come up. And when I first saw that picture, I thought, wow, he looks just like Benito Mussolini. Well, that is Benito Mussolini, which proves once again that you can't trust the internet. But, <laughs> but I got to thinking about these two men, who if you, if you look at them, that's, that's the real Harry, by the way. Um, they are physically similar, and they were certainly philosophically in tune. Both believed that the state knew best. Both had an extreme dislike for people of color, and both were consummate bureaucrats and manipulators. Um, indeed, they were not unlike some of the current leaders of our time, uh, kind of like this guy. <laughs> uh, Trumpism, I've come to believe, is nothing more than fascism with hair. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I digress. Um, <laughs> In, in 1962, after heading up the, uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for more than 30 years, uh, Mr. Anslinger was finally forced into retirement, but he went into the political consultancy business, um, and he shifted his attention full-time to the international stage, where he had already been working with a, a small cabal of like-minded prohibitionists, and he helped to draft and pass the UN Single Convention Treaty on Narcotics and Drugs, which you've already heard a bit about today. He also helped lay the groundwork for the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. These two international documents have terrific influence even today uh, around the globe, uh, despite the fact that the 1961 UN Single Convention Treaty is rooted in policies that date back to the League of Nations in the 1920s. Obviously, uh, uh, honestly, the, the need for reform of global drug policy is simply enormous. In the late 1960s, the U.S. reformed its own drug laws, bringing them more in line with the U.N. Con single convention, and Mr. Anslinger's legacy dictated that marijuana be placed in Schedule I, which in my country is the most restrictive of the schedules. But it was a controversial placement from the very beginning, and, at the, and a presidential commission was appointed to look into uh, cannabis and decide the proper scheduling for it. Um, th this, this committee, called the Schaefer Committee, um, in 1972 delivered its findings to President Nixon. They said that marijuana should be decriminalized, and they noted that in the research they had had conducted, there were a couple of uh, serendipitous discoveries that indicated this may be a very useful therapeutic drug. But President Nixon, in the best memory hole tradition, simply dismissed the findings, declared a war on drugs, and made marijuana a cornerstone of his culturally divisive pro uh, policies. Marijuana remained in Schedule I. Now, around this time, Robert and I were in college together. It is fair to say that we were part of Mr. Nixon's hated counterculture. We were hippies. In fact, we smoked pot because it was fun and daring to do so. We weren't activists for the weed. We weren't activists at all. Like most college students, we were very focused on the drama of becoming adults. We became close friends while we were in college and realized one day that we had fallen in love. And quite frankly, it was a shock to both of us. Um, it took a little bit of time to sort things out, to put that into context. Um, but we, we succeeded with that. After college, we did separate for a little while, Robert going to Washington, DC, where he hoped to become a speechwriter, but instead ended up driving a taxi cab. And that is where he noticed that his sight was getting progressively worse. And so he was diagnosed in 1972 the same year as the Schaefer Commission, uh, with glaucoma, and he was just 24 years old. His ophthalmologist tried every available medication, but Robert still suffered the visual manifestations of glaucoma, 
which include tricolored halos around streetlights or whiteouts when the world would simply disappear behind a blazing white fog. This slide, taken um, in 1975, sort of inadvertently mimics this tricolored halo phenomena. Only this time, the tricolored halo is around Robert's head. After his move to Washington, Robert had very few contacts, and he did not use marijuana for quite a while. But a few months after his diagnosis, a newfound friend gave him a marijuana cigarette. And on a memorable night, he, um, he was in his apartment. He looked out the window. He saw the tricolored halos. And he decided, well, I'm going to smoke this joint. I'm going to uh, forget my, my problems. I'm going to listen to a little music. I'm going to get stoned. And so he, he did. <laughs> he lit the joint. He settled down to enjoy the music. He got up a short time later went past the same window, looked out, and immediately realized the tricolored halos were gone. In our 1998 book, The Marijuana Rx, The Patient's Fight for Medicinal Pot, he described that event in these words. It was a singular moment. I immediately drew the connection between the use of marijuana and the now absent halos. Indeed, parts of my brain absorbed the connection so quickly and so assuredly that I was certain I must be stoned, which of course I was. I, I tried to follow the exploding synaptic spasm, but was quickly left behind. The thought was too fast, too large and complex to pursue and understand, to place into words. In retrospect, I believe that what Robert is describing is the activity of his endogenous cannabinoid system. But the discovery of the ECS was still almost 20 years in the future. And even when he wrote these words in 1998, the discovery of the endogenous cannabinoid system was still less than a decade old. He told no one about his discovery except me. I was working in Florida at the time, and he told me on the telephone one night. And I have to admit, I scoffed at the idea. It was a reaction that he anticipated. And it's why we told nobody else, especially his doctor. But after we began living together in 1974, it didn't take me long at all to realize that he really did see better and function better when we had marijuana supplies. And so having a regular supply of marijuana became a, a crucial part of our life together. That eventually led us to grow a few plants, and that led to our arrest in August of 1975. Now, we could have paid a fine and been done with it. But that would have done nothing to change the fact that Robert needed marijuana to save his sight. If we had had any doubts about that at all, they were quickly er erased in the first few weeks after our arrest, when our supplies completely dried up and Robert experienced severe ocular difficulties. We realized that we had to fight the charges against us, that Robert's sight was dependent upon it. And so armed with good minds and youthful optimism, we set out to prove that Robert's use of marijuana was medically necessary. And honestly, we had no idea where this would take us. It can safely be said that Robert was a complete surprise to US drug agencies. He flew in low, as they say, under the radar. The US agencies were simply not prepared for a single individual who could so, who could so effectively challenge the prohibition. The data he was able to compile with the help of researchers from the University of California in Los Angeles, um, it was simply irrefutable. And the juxtaposition of the criminal case with the granting of the federal petition requesting legal access created a vortex of public and legal attention for which US drug agencies were simply not prepared. And quite frankly, neither were we. I immediately upon the news breaking, we started to hear from patients who wanted what Robert had, legal access to marijuana. Robert stated at that time that he felt like the only one to make the lifeboat. All around us were cries from, from seriously ill individuals who needed our help, who had been like we were. They thought that they were alone in the dark, and now suddenly there was a ray of hope. Our youthful optimism led us to believe that our government could act, would act, in good faith, and that they, it would help these people just as they had helped Robert. 
but they didn't. Government doors slammed shut, bureaucrats hunkered down, and Robert would be the only one in the lifeboat for several years. We began to organize the patients and helped pass state laws. The first was actually in 1978. And these state laws acknowledged the medical value of marijuana and sought to establish statewide programs of research using federal supplies of marijuana. Eventually, there were 34 such state laws in the late 70s and early 80s. And we were ecstatic because we felt that this would satisf satisfy the federal government's insistence that all it needed was the research to prove marijuana's medicinal value and it would change the regulations prohibiting its use. Now, from the very beginning, Robert was the leader of this movement. Um, and he began to speak out on every occasion offered to him. He began to educate the American public about marijuana's medical value. He had a master's degree in rhetoric, and he was an excellent debater and incredibly articulate. The federal government was not very happy with that particular aspect of his personality. Um, and just a few months after Robert began to receive marijuana, he also began to re receive threats from the federal government. They told him that if he did not shut, down, shut up, they would shut down his medical supplies of marijuana. Um, well, Robert didn't shut up. Um, at one point, he was even threatened, whoops, I've gotten ahead of myself here. Um, at one point, he, he was threatened by numerous bureaucrats, um, and at, at, at one point, he was even threatened by the drug abuse advisor to uh, President Jimmy Carter, Dr. Peter Bourne, who you see here. In 1978, the government made good on the promise, luring his doctor away from Washington, D.C., with a lucrative professorship in another state. Robert was able to locate another doctor who was willing to make the application to help Robert, but the federal government refused to cooperate with this gentleman. And so we faced going back to court. Only this time, we were going back to court as plaintiffs. We filed a civil suit with the help of one of Washington, D.C.'s finest law firms, Steptoe & Johnson, who agreed to represent Robert on a pro bono basis. The case they prepared was extremely good. Uh, and once it was filed, the government offered to settle within 48 hours. We wanted to go to trial. We wanted to make it more public. But our lawyers encouraged us to take the settlement. They promised us that if we did so, Robert's supplies would never be threatened again. And they were right. From May of 1978 until the time of his death in June of 2001, Robert received a monthly supply of medical marijuana cigarettes. And when he died in 2001, he still had his eyesight, 29 years after the original diagnosis of, of, in 1972. The law firm also helped us establish the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics, which was the first nonprofit association dedicated to medical cannabis. The Alliance had numerous successes, but foremost was our, in my mind anyway, was our, was our involvement as the lead party in the historic case of in the matter of marijuana rescheduling. Robert Clark um, alluded to this uh, decision earlier today. It consisted of two years of hearings before the DEA Administrative Law Judge, Chief Administrative Law Judge, Francis Young, who in 1988 uh, said that marijuana was inappropriately placed in Schedule I and should be rescheduled. The DEA Administrator, however, overruled his own judge and kept marijuana in Schedule I. And because of the administrative technicalities involved, this decision was upheld in the Court of Appeals. By, 19, by the 1990s, we had become frontline veterans um, of a drug war that, and had witnessed a callous federal government that turned its back on its citizens, disregarded the wishes of its states, and shunned the findings of its own legal advisors. The AIDS crisis was upon us, and it was in full bloom, and we were hearing from many uh, patients with AIDS 
who said that marijuana was very helpful in terms of quelling the nausea that was caused by powerful AIDS medications. We realized that this gave us another opportunity. We established a group called MARS, the Marijuana AIDS Research Service. And what we did was compile the forms that doctors would need to apply for compassionate use of marijuana into a very tight, compact form that a doctor and patient could sit down and fill out in about 20 minutes, as opposed to the 8 to 20 hours that had previously been required. We knew that hundreds of, of AIDS patients would apply, and they did. And we also knew that the federal government had only two possible options. They could find a way to grant these requests, or they could shut down the program. It should come to no one, it should come, it come as a surprise to no one, that they chose the latter. They grandfathered in the dozen or so recipients who were already um, uh, receiving uh, marijuana through the Compassionate Use Program, including three AIDS patients but they slammed the door on any future recipients. In taking this action, the US federal government vastly underestimated the sophistication of the public's awareness of medical cannabis. This was 1991, and the medical use of cannabis was extremely well known. Editorials began to appear across the country, calling on the government to act with compassion, but incredibly they refused, and they stated specifically that it was because too many AIDS patients were asking for help. In a moment of monumental stupidity, the head of the US Public Health Service stated that if AIDS patients used medical cannabis, they would practice unsafe sex and spread the disease even more. The country's response to this was absolute fury. In California, with a large population of AIDS patients, they took to the streets and they also took to the ballot box. Local, pa local petitions popped up in various cities across the state, and Prop P, the first time citizens could cast a vote for medical cannabis, um, was easily passed in San Francisco in November of 1991. This paved the way for the famous Prop 215, the statewide ballot initiative passed in 1996 <coughs> beginning another round of state laws authorizing the medical use of cannabis. But this time, the laws stated that supplies could be grown in trust state. The states no longer looked to the federal government for help. They had been down that road before, and they knew it was a dead end. Now, Robert was not a fan of grow your own medicine. And he worried that, in his words, the street theater of California's MedPot activists would harm the movement. But by the time Prop 215 was passed in November of 1996, Robert was facing a much bigger battle than medical cannabis. He had been diagnosed with AIDS in late 1994 and was critically ill for most of 1995, nearly dying in the, in the late fall of that year. He emerged from his brush with death to find a new world of the AIDS cocktail, a mixture of powerful medications that managed to prolong his life for another five years. But his time on the front line was done. He became remarkably uninterested in medical cannabis, preferring instead the simple joys of family, gardening, and our beautiful Florida sunsets. In 1998, we did publish our memoir which gave him a chance to reflect upon what we had accomplished. But his race was over, and he died on June 2nd, 2001. I am often asked, what would Robert think of today's medical cannabis scene? Today, as you've heard, there's kind of a, um, a discussion about how many laws uh, we have in, in the United States. But by my reckoning, there are 24 state laws um, which recognize the, uh, the value of the whole plant cannabis. And then there's also another 15 or 20 laws of the so-called CBD-only laws. Um, it's estimated that there are more than 2 million Americans who are legally using cannabis, and obviously that would greatly please Robert. But as I said, he was not a fan of grow your own medicine. He felt that the seriously ill 
had enough to worry about without becoming gardeners. And he resolutely believed that cannabis should be available just like any other medication. You go to see a physician, and then you go to a pharmacy to pick up your medicine. This is how Robert received his medication for 25 years. But there are many facets of today's medical cannabis world that would thrill Robert. Firstly, the discovery of the endogenous cannabinoid system, it is simply a wonder of science. Um, and, and I actually believe it's going to be heralded as one of the great discoveries of the late 20th century. For so many years, Robert and I wondered how could cannabis be so efficient in so many different disease categories? And as you've heard today, we now know why. It's, through, it's because of this wonderful thing within us called the endogenous cannabinoid system. Secondly, Robert would be delighted with the, the direction that state laws took in the years between 2002 and 2010. For the most part, those laws are kind of a hybrid of do-it-yourself cultivation or large-scale cultivation by entrepreneurs. These entrepreneurs began the type of intensive cannabinoid research and development that had desperately been needed. And to borrow the words of your Prime Minister, Mr. Turnbull, these innovative and agile manufacturers have, in short, conducted some very exciting R&D that the U.S. government should have conducted in the 1980s and 90s. The intelligence and the curiosity of these young people is frankly exhilarating to me, and they have a great deal to teach us. They demonstrate the benefits and the, of openness and intellectual curiosity when it comes to research, rather than, the, rather than the contrived and stilted research that comes from attempting to prop up a discredited pro prohibition. The one thing that has not happened, in, but which would be wonderfully exciting, is and I believe an opportunity that is now available in Australia, is for clinical research to move forward using cannabis that is grown intrastate. This cannot happen in the U.S. because of the U.S. continue, because of the continuing intransigence of the U.S. federal government, which prohibits research, well, which prohibits formal research uh, with any marijuana other than federally grown marijuana. In a world that is awash with cannabis, U.S. researchers are told they can only use marijuana grown on a small bit of acreage at the University of Mississippi. For the U.S. drug agencies, this marijuana is the only true marijuana. And while agencies will publicly deny that cannabis has medical value, their employees have personally taken out patents on CBD and other cannabinoids. In, to my way of thinking, this is shameless and immoral. And it raises, once again, Onslinger's memory hole. Mon that memory hole has evolved into a convoluted logic that rivals that of another Alice, Alice in Wonderland. U.S. drug agencies, to my mind, have become like the Red Queen. They fuss, they complain, they order people about with no other discernible goal but to maintain their own power. As the Red Queen says, it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. <laughs> it would all be quite laughable, except that lives are truly at stake here, as we all know. And the U.S. government seems content to let that go on and on and on. Which brings me to my thoughts on Australia and the opportunities that I think you now have ahead of you. I cannot be begin <laughs> to express how envious I am that your federal government has actually chosen to listen to its citizenry and move into a proactive fashion to remove the barriers that prohibit research and access. I realize that this action only took place after considerable lobbying from citizens. But in the US, we have been lobbying for 40 years without results. The removal of federal barriers to allow states to set their own regulatory schemes is, as I hope you can see, vastly preferable to the U.S. model with its true marijuana and its continued meddling in state laws. Here in Australia, <clears throat> here in Australia I believe you have a tremendous opportunity 
to become world leaders in cannabis research. And for those lawmakers who may still be in attendance or who may be listening, I encourage you to create a welcoming environment for medical cannabis, because to do so will attract both intelligence and investment. And best of all, it will provide a better quality of life for many of your most unfortunate citizens. The US is, sadly, still linked to the onslinger foolishness of the 20th century. He and his ilk created a climate that has proven injurious to patients and to scientific knowledge. And while he is the dominant figure of, of cannabis prohibition history, he is by no means the only individual to hate cannabis. The problem of cannabis bias existed before Harry Onslinger, it is with us today, and it will be with us in the future. Indeed, I have come to believe that there is a botanical bigotry that exists with respect to cannabis that may even go as deep as epigenetics, which is to say, the genetic passing on of bigotry and hatred. But the discovery of the endogenous cannabinoid system, which you have heard so much about today and will learn even more about tomorrow, makes it very clear that the cannabis issue has moved beyond a question of civil rights, and in my way of thinking, beyond even a question of medical necessity. Legal access to cannabis is a biological right. We are hardwired for cannabis, and the evidence is simply overwhelming. Our bodies are constantly producing natural cannabinoid-like substances to maintain our well-being, and when those naturally produced cannabinoids are not enough to maintain balance, cannabis can be an extremely effective medication. This system is remarkably similar to our body's ability to produce endorphins, uh, substances that help control pain, substances that are mimicked by the poppy plant. And as we've heard today, Australia exports 52% of the world's licit poppy supply. I believe Australia has a similar opportunity with cannabis. If they are open enough to reform and aggressive enough to move forward, I wish this great country every success in its pioneering efforts to bring sanity to the worldwide stage. There will be pushback. I promise you that. I think you've heard some of it today. But to return again to the wonderful imagery of Lewis Carroll, when Alice, who's, as she grows tall, the dormouse complains. I'm being squeezed, he says. And Alice rather meekly replies, well, I can't help it, I'm growing. You have no right to grow here, Dick declares the dormouse. And when Alice states, everyone, even the dormouse grows, he replies, yes, but I grow at a reasonable pace. <laughs> this then is the mantra of those charged with righting the wrong of 80 years of prohibition. They listen to our pleas, they nod sympathetically, and they say, we understand but we must move at a reasonable pace. We can't move too quickly. We can't grow too quickly. In the US, a reasonable pace has come to, come to mean CBD-only laws, passed primarily because of parents with children with intractable epilepsy. They are told their children will soon have relief. Smiling pictures of politicians with gravely ill children flood the airwaves, all is well except that not everyone who requires cannabis is a child, and nor is every illness responsive to CBD. But most infuriating of all is that after these pictures are snapped, after the ink dries on the legislation, the parents and their children continue to wait as bureaucrats grind their way through endless hearings on who will cultivate, who will dispense, in the U.S., the states seem locked in a battle to have the toughest regulations, assuring the public that they are not like California or Colorado, which pro prohibitionists portray as a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah, but where there has been no significant diversion, teenage use has not increased, and where opioid deaths or deaths from overdose opioids have been reduced by 25%. But never mind, because the facts, as the Red Queen says, it takes all the running you can do uh, to keep in the same place. My hope 
is that patients in Australia will soon benefit from this incredible plant legally and in concert with their physicians. We have come so far in 40 years, but we have so many patients who are still waiting, waiting, waiting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have security trying to usher us out, so I'm just going to say thanks for coming. Thank you very much to all our speakers today. It's been incredible. Uh, we also wanted to draw your attention to uh, the survey, which is on the United and Compassion website, which is uh, basically a part of a, a broader project uh, run alongside the Australian National University. We're trying to get as much information as we can from uh, patients who have been using uh, medicinal cannabis uh, and their, their families and caregivers as well. So if you could please be part of that, that would be awesome. Uh, there is also a, um, just a sheet by the door there. We're trying to gather as much information as we can for our database as well. So if you could please fill that in if possible, that would be awesome. Hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow, if not all of you. And um, I just wish you all the best and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.